Hi, this is Phil Shapiro in Tacoma Park, Maryland. I came across this really interesting new book, A Crack in Creation, Gene Editing and the Unthinkable Power to Control Evolution by Jennifer Doudna and Samuel H. Sternberg. So Jennifer Doudna is a brilliant scientist who had a role in the development of this technology called CRISPR gene editing technology. And this is her own personal story, um, but it's also the story of CRISPR. So it reads like a personal narrative, but it's also scientific history. And it's really quite fascinating. Jennifer Doudna is professor in chemistry and the molecular and cell biology departments at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, she's internationally recognized as a leading expert on RNA protein biochemistry. CRISPR Biology and Genome Engineering. And the co-author of this book is Samuel Sternberg. He's a biochemist. So this is, um, it's a collaborative work, but uh, throughout the, the book, it's written in the first person. It just makes it more readable. And it, the, the honest truth is that Jennifer is uh, one of the main characters in this story, the scientific story. So, um, before you even start looking at this review, this book review, I recommend that you go to the People's University, which is YouTube, and look up the conversation between Dan Rather and Jennifer Doudna, and this is from September 2016, a very interesting interview. Then you might also want to go and look at her TED Talk, Jennifer Doudna TED Talk. Just search, search YouTube for Doudna TED Talk. This is from the inside jacket of the book. A Crack in Creation is a scientific thriller and a gripping read framed as a personal voyage by a brilliant scientist who played a major role in developing what is currently one of the most promising and powerful ways of editing our genomes. Venki Ramakrishnan, president of the Royal Society. Um, now, I have to admit, the book jacket writer, the person who wrote the book jacket here, might have had a few extra cups of coffee because it comes across a little too strong, but I'm going to read it to you here. It's interesting. Uh, not since the atomic bomb has a technology so alarmed its inventors that they warned the world about its use. Not that is until the spring of 2015 when biologist Jennifer Doudna called for a worldwide moratorium on the use of the new gene editing tool CRISPR, a revolutionary technology that she helped create to make heritable changes in human embryos. The cheapest, simplest, most effective way of manipulating DNA ever known, CRISPR may well give us the cure to HIV, genetic diseases, and some cancers, and will help address the world's hunger crisis. Yet even the tiniest changes to DNA could have a myriad unforeseeable consequences, to say nothing of the ethical and societal repercussions of intentionally mutating embryos to create better humans. So, um, uh, the book jacket, it's a little bit over the top, but maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not over the top. So this is from the opening chapter. My name is Jennifer Doudna. I'm a biochemist. I've spent the majority of my career in a laboratory conducting research on topics that most people outside of my field have never heard of. In the past half decade, however, I've become involved in a groundbreaking area of the life sciences, a subject whose progress cannot be contained by the four walls of any academic research center. My colleagues and I have been swept up by this irresistible force, not unlike the tsunami in my dream. By the summer of 2015, the biotechnology that I'd helped establish only a few years earlier before was growing at a pace that I could not have imagined, and its implications were seismic, not just for the life sciences, but for all life on Earth. This book is its story and mine. It's also yours, because it won't be long before the repercussions from this technology reach your doorstep too. So she goes to, uh, I mean, it, uh, if you're at all interested in science, this is a very interesting read. Um, I will never forget the first time I heard the term CRISPR. It was 20, 2006. I was sitting in my office on the seventh floor of the Stanley Hall, University of California, Berkeley, when the phone rang. On the line was Jillian Banfield, a fellow Berkeley professor. So the two of them have a meeting at, at a food uh, eatery in Berkeley, and we, as the reader of the book, get to uh, enjoy the benefit of 
listening in on their conversation, which was kind of a historic conversation uh, between two brilliant scientists. And then, uh, this is one of the main themes of the book, is the ethical and moral dimensions of this technology. The issue is this, for the roughly 100,000 years of modern human existence, the Homo sapiens genome has been shaped by the twin force of random mutation and natural selection. Now, for the first time ever, we possess the ability to edit not only the DNA of every living human being, but also the DNA of future generations, in essence, to direct the evolution of our own species. This is unprecedented in the history of life on Earth. It is beyond our comprehension. And it forces us to confront an impossible but essential question. What will we, a fractious species whose members can't agree on much, choose to do with this awesome power? So, uh, <laughs> when you read a paragraph like that, you say, well, she's actually right. We are a very fractious species who disagree on a lot of stuff. Um, and we have to have more conversations. And that's why we need, we need to gather people together at public libraries for conversations on philosophical topics, including the topics raised in this book. Um, I'd like you to go and look up a book called Socrates Cafe and look up, um, Socrates Cafe is, is philosophical discussions that take place in public libraries and other public settings. Um, and so that's the kind of thing we need to help us come to grips as a community on some of these issues. For many scientists, myself included, cases such as Kim's were exciting, not only because they revealed the curative power of natural gene editing, but also because they shone light on a potential avenue of medical intervention. These good luck stories demonstrated that intentional gene editing would be possible if scientists had the genetic know-how and the biotechnology tools to pull it off. So this this uh, quote I have is from a, a chapter that talks about a patient who had a genetic condition and the genetic condition spontaneously um, cured itself. And doctors were baffled. And then they did some tests on the DNA. And um, the process of that self-cure was one in a billion or something, but it shone light on the genetic process. In part one of this book, The Tools, Sam and I share the thrilling backstory of CRISPR technology, including how it begins with a study of bacterial immune system and how it benefit, benefited from the decade-long journey to develop methods of rewriting DNA insights inside cells. In part two, The Task, we explore the myriad applications, both present and future of CRISPR, in animals, plants, and humans, and we discuss the exciting opportunities as well as the significant challenges that lie ahead. So I think this book is good for any adult reader, but I'd love to see this book being read in high schools because uh, high school students, some of them 11th and 12th graders, those taking advanced placement science classes, uh, or even philosophy classes in high school, those high schools that offer philosophy classes, um, this would be an interesting book to, uh, to have. Maybe some forward-thinking school districts like the Rio School District over in California or Penn Manor School District over in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Some of those school districts might choose to um, a cracking creation. Um, so here's my contact information if you're interested in contacting me and my collection of book reviews. I have about 50 book reviews in video form and some just in text. Uh, sites.google.com slash site Phil Shapiro book reviews. And for those of you curious about how I make this book review, I have an old laptop, a ThinkPad T400, it's from like 2007 or so. And I make this video uh, screencast book reviews uh, on this old laptop. I use Linux and a free program called Simple Screen Recorder. And I have an external monitor hooked up, a 23 inch monitor, so I have full HD 1920 by 1080 just in case anybody wants to take one of my book reviews and put it onto a public access television channel or use it in any other way, they could just grab the video. You don't have to ask me permission. And um, I have a Logitech webcam. I love my Logitech C920. Other Logitech webcams are also excellent. And I'm recording my audio with my Olympus digital audio recorder, which uh, gives me CD quality audio. So, um, ask your public library to buy a copy of this book. 
if they haven't bought one already, this book needs to be on display on the new bookshelf. And if you work at a college or a high school, this book belongs in those libraries too. Until next time, bye.